singing. Like oil upon your feet, like wine for you to drink, like water for my heart, till every drop, amen? Every drop, what a privilege. Listen, what a privilege that we have this access of approach, the veil torn, the immediacy of being in the presence, in the throne room, in the presence of God this morning. Let's not miss this moment. Would you close your eyes for a moment? I just want to, I want to take us to the word for just a second with your eyes closed very briefly. Before Passover, we just finished talking about this through the resurrection season, if you will. And there's a supper happening, and Mary comes in with this pound of perfume. This is really one of my absolute most favorite passages, beautiful passage, this perfume. Um, the cost would be the equivalent of saving every penny for an entire year. She comes into where Jesus is and she pours it all out. She anoints his feet. And then she takes her hair down, which really represents for a woman her glory. And she begins to wipe the feet of Jesus with her hair, with her glory. It says the house is filled with a fragrance of perfume. This is, um, this is worship. This is worship. This is what it looks like to worship just this type of sacrifice to say, you know what, this is my most prized possession maybe. This is my, this, this is a sacrifice. This has cost a lot. But in comparison, in comparison, to you, Jesus. What can I do? What can I do to um, to show you, Jesus, the depth of my gratitude to to pour out upon you, Jesus, the magnitude of what you deserve to give you an expression, but but more than an expression of of just to say I love you, but to sacrifice with this expression of adoration and of worship. You're worth it. You're more than worth it. This is worship. So just in this place, I'm going to ask the team to lead us one more time in that chorus. And I want you to think about this privilege that we have in the presence of Jesus. The fact that Holy Spirit right now is in the room with us, moving amongst us, resting upon us. For some of us, bringing comfort. For some of us, whispering words of life and hope. For some of us, renewing us and bringing joy from what has been a season of mourning. For some of us, empowering us and reminding us who we are. For some of us, whispering in our ear, continue to wait because our God's at work. The Holy Spirit's here. Just in the presence of Jesus. Can we sing this chorus to him one more time? Like wine for you to drink, like water from my heart. I pour my love on you. If praise is like perfume, how lavish mine on you. So every drop is gone. our offering today would you accept our our praise be enthroned on our praise father
enthroned on our worship today. We adore you. We magnify you. We lift you. We exalt you. Lord, we know that, that when you are the focus, God, when you are the center of attention, when we hold you high, God, you draw so close and we ask for your nearness today, Jesus. We thank you. We thank you. How can we thank you enough? What can, what can we say? What can we do? How can we thank you enough? How can we thank you enough? Would you just bless the Lord this morning, right where you are, just tell him thank you for his goodness, thank you for your kindness, thank you love for us, for your provision, for your power. Thank you. You can quietly have a seat where you are. I want to encourage you this morning. Um, you know, that passage is interesting because um, it's interesting to me how many times Jesus, that we see this, we see something play out and, and um, and there's always this moment, right? Judas is in the room as well. And um, he's got ideas of his own. He sees this happen. And what is she doing? Why would she do this? This is crazy. This is so expensive. I mean, if she really wanted to get the value out of that, she could have sold that. What could she have done? What good, what better could she have done? Right? Um, that's kind of been the hope and the heart behind everything that we've been talking about in our identity as believers, as followers of Jesus, as table setters. That's been, God, it's, it's our heart that you're after. And whatever it is that you ask, whatever it is you desire, that we would not be found in a place with the spirit of Judas questioning it all. That we would just be willing to say whatever it is you're saying to us, we yes and amen. Who knows? Did God put that on her heart? What do you have, Mary? I do have something. What a waste. No, no, no. She did something beautiful. It was extravagant. It was humble. The fragrance filled the air. It wasn't just the essence. It was worship. She pre she's preparing me for burial. And you know what, Judas, no matter what you could have ever done with that, because of this that she does for me today, She'll be remembered forever. Man, my heart for us as a church um, is that that would be our posture in every way. God, whatever it is that you're asking, we just simply say yes and amen. Yes and amen, Jesus. Yes and amen. What the world might think is wasteful, you call worship. And so this morning, we, we have a testimony from one of our families and um, and. These people are really special to Kelly and me. And I honor them because of their sacrifice. When, when God whispered declaration into the reality of my pastor's ear, Pastor Jeff, and, um, and then when he began to shout it to our hearts because we're a little stubborn, right? We were like, in a public school with squatty potties? No, thanks, God. But these people who were deeply rooted in the family at Wood's Edge, deeply visible everyone knew them um, they made a real sacrificial choice to say yes and amen and they said we're going to go and we're going to plant a church because we're going to sow legacy we're going to plant some seeds for trees we may never see but praise God you guys have been able to see some, some life and some fruit amen and so we just, we just want to thank uh, Donald who's one of our elders and Kathy who's an elder family and you know when you think of Donald and Kathy, would you pray for them? Because Kathy's struggled with health for years, and now Donald's struggling. And, um, you know, we pray for him that God would continue just to, to do in his life what he is desiring to do. Um, I've just never seen a heart in a couple more yielded to God. And so can we listen to, can we, let's listen to their testimony, and then we'll come back and, and, and talk just a little bit about table and our, and our offering and, and how we give to God. And then um, we'll get into the word this morning. Can we do that? Amen. All right, let's watch this video.
I'm Kathy. This is Donald. And we've been at Declaration for actually nine years from day one. And so we were part of the setup and tear down at the, you know, at the very beginning. Donald was, um, of course, he's an elder. Uh, we were, he liked to set up the communion, just trying to make everybody welcome. You know, and that was one thing that Donald was really big on too. He'd be out there in the parking lot with an umbrella, you know, <laughs> waiting for people to come into church and just making them feel like we really are a family because that didn't take but, you know, a few minutes to, at Declaration to feel that we were part of, part of something really important, um, something that was going to be big. We felt like we were being obedient. God really had uh, a, a big plan for this. Uh, for this area, and we really felt that as well. When the first, I think the first started was like the movement, and we all had the t-shirts, and we were all getting excited about, you know, getting to make a plan, a commitment to, you know, to a financial commitment. And of course, there wasn't really anything for us to think about other than, okay, what's our commitment going to be? I will say <clears throat> our financial advisors were a little surprised, <laughs> but um, and say you know we're saying, but this is what we really feel that we need to do, and uh, we went along with it and did it. For us, in spite of the different health challenges, you know, with the cancer, Donald now has neurological issues, um, completely unexpected, out of the blue, that we weren't sure how we were going to handle. But again, we just had to trust God. Um, when I look and think we're, we get to be part of something, it's, it's going to be like a city on a hill. I will, praying and hoping that it is a light for the community, that people will always want to, to be a part of it or to be drawn to it. Again, because it's authentic, it's real, and it's loving, and it's truthful, and it's Jesus. And I can say, hey, you know what, we were a part of that at the beginning, you know, when we were church in a box for <laughs> several years, you know, we were a part of it. And just to look and see, and see people coming to Christ, so this, to make a difference in the community, to, to be a place of life, um, to bring life to those that need it, honestly share the blessings that God gives us, whatever it is, whatever is small, large, whatever, just to be able to share that. It's so much fun and it's, it's such an exciting time and an exciting place to be. And uh, come and be a part of it. Check us out. <laughs>
and you've heard of table, um, you've been giving even, or maybe you haven't yet given through declaration is just part of your worship here. We want to invite you to do that. Everything that happens, every penny has a purpose and every dollar that goes through declaration is already allocated to setting the table. So together we're already setting the table, amen? And it is making a difference, not just here in the 386, but all around the world. In fact, this morning, I don't know if you're like me, I'm trying to catch up and, and, and keep up with the news. I've had a harder time in the last few days, but I know that there's a lot of things happening right now in the Middle East, especially concerning Israel. And I hope you're praying right now. You know, in fact, we need to be praying right now. Even right now, just in your spirit, Lord, would you just please bring your protection and provision to your people. We know that God holds his people near and dear. And so as one way that we set the table through our generosity is we also give our first fruit. Listen, we give our first fruits because we see that as biblical. God tells us, take care of his people and he will take care of us. We don't do that for if then. We do, we do it because God's told us to. And so literally, 1% we know of and a little bit more sacrificially, we sow first and fast to the gospel, bringing the gospel in Israel. Did you realize that even in Israel, as the Bible tells us, Israel is almost to the point statistically where they could be considered an unreached people group. Israel. And so we know it's close to the heart of God, his chosen people. And so uh, we get to be a part of that through saying the table. Amen. Well, can we clap and cheer? Hey, in fact, stand up with me if you will. Come on, let's clap. Let's celebrate what the Lord is doing in and through us. Turn to a neighbor right now and say three Sundays, three Sundays from now, all right? And do me a favor, go find about five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten people. Give them a hug, give them a high five. Tell somebody that you're so glad they're at church today. Come on, welcome somebody. Are you glad you came today? I am too. I am too. 24 years ago, I don't know if I could have ever imagined that I would be looking ahead to next year, knowing that exactly one half of my life literally had been lived being a part of a ministry that would give opportunity for so many people to encounter Jesus in such a life-changing way. Now, next year, we're going to celebrate 25 years of this little thing called the 220 Student Conference. And again, not just for, yeah, come on, somebody, that's good. Hey, man, hello. Um, not just for students necessarily, but, you know, that, that, that thing was launched and built around um, calling people to rise up in resurrected power, right? Passionate faith, to live this message, this life message of uh, what Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I that lives. And it's crazy to consider that it, literally half of my life has been, you know, serving in that capacity. P.S., this is a shameless plug for you to serve, give, and go. Amen. All right. Um, so sign up. It's going to be good. Mom and dad, uh, if you've got students, uh, sign them up. Money, is, money will not be the no. Um, the only no is going to be if, if we choose other things instead of that. And please, let's not. It's probably one of the most life-altering, most impactful weeks that your student and you can take place, you know, can, can have. So make sure you do that. So as we approach year 24 here in just a few weeks, uh, a few weeks, dear Lord, <laughs> um, I will once again have the privilege to stand before the generation and, and, and I will prayerfully um, say some things. I will encourage them. Prayerfully, I will encourage them. And I will say something that I have said multiple times a week for literally now It'll be 24 years, and it is this statement right here. Remember who you are, remember whose you are, and remember what you're called to be. Remember who you are. You are 
a son, a daughter of the Most High King. You are royalty. You are more than a conqueror. You are rooted in Christ, built up. You are seated in a place of priority, Ephesians 2. Remember who you are. Remember whose you are. You're, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. You belong to the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He has adopted you, not abandoned you. He has forgiven you and set you free, not forsaken you. Remember whose you are. Remember what you're called to be. When you surrender and you, you yield your life to him, he is going to do incredible things in and through you. Things that you cannot even imagine. So that's, that's a statement that's going to be said. It was the seventh inning of game seven of the 2016 World Series. Anybody, were you there for it? Any uh, Cleveland fans? It was the Indians, but now it's the Guardians. Anybody a Cubs fan? Good, because we were going to have to have a repentance service right now. I'm just playing. All right. Um, so the two teams in question, right? It was the Chicago Cubs um, and the Cleveland Indians. They entered this matchup as the two franchises with the longest World Series title droughts. A combined 176 seasons without a championship between the two. The Chicago Cubs, they're leading 6-3, to three, game seven, remember? And they were hoping, I mean, that, look, they, they, they bring in their dominant relief pitcher named Araldis Chapman. Anybody know who he is? Let me show you his picture from when he played for the Cubs. But let me show you my favorite picture of him of all time. Go to that next one, Daniel. Anybody know what that picture is? <laughs> let me just, because I have to, let me show you why this is my favorite picture. <laughs> Okay, now watch what happens. Such a great moment. There's a little tear in my eye right now. Did you see it? When that, that little smile? That's my favorite of all time. You're probably wondering, why are we doing this? Let's keep going. <laughs> so they were going to bring in the dominant pitcher, or all this Chapman, to get the final outs, and hopefully this would seal the victory for the Cubs and break their longtime curse. Indians, man, um, a a as they come up, you know, um, they get a double, they get a two-run home homer, and now the game is tied. It seems like Chapman has been doing that for quite some time for his teams, <laughs> right? Cleveland had the momentum, and then you've got the Cubby faithful. If Joe Hans is watching this right now, He'll love this story. But the Cubby faithful, all too familiar. They're thinking, here's where the wheels completely fall off. That's kind of the way we feel right now. Um, as well as, oh gosh, the curse is still alive, despair. This, all the feelings. And then providence intervenes, right? The rain picks up. Um, progressive field ground crew. They roll out the rain tarp onto the field. They force players and managers and fans alike to wait anxiously for this 10th inning, um, to, for this tie game to continue. Um, sensing uh, deflated and defeated you know, spirits in the Cubs dugout in the clubhouse there. Um, there's another player named Jason Hayward for the Cubs. He calls the team together. I think we got his picture right there. He calls the team together to passionately exhort them to this. He says this to the team. Remember who you are. Remember who you are. See, he reminds the Cubs of their identity as the best regular season team in baseball. They were victors in two other rounds of the playoffs. And, a, and they were a team that came back from a three-game deficit in the World Series to force a game seven. Remember who you are. It was their game to win as much as it was their game to lose. Now, invigorated and inspired by this fresh dose of truth, the Cubby Bats rally for a two go-ahead runs in the top of the 10th inning. The Cubs could have accepted defeat, but instead they charged ahead, fueled by the truth of who they were, and they won their first World Series championship in 108 years. Remember who you are. Remember who you are. See, sometimes life can throw some curveballs, right? Sometimes we forget who we are. Sometimes we forget what God has said to us in the past. We forget the wilderness moments where manna appeared. We forget um, the rivers that have been parted. We forget, we forget because things happen. We forget our God-created purpose. Some of us may not yet even know what that God-created that, that God purpose is. And possibly that's what you're here seeking this, this morning, you're, you're looking for that. God, what is it that you have created me for? What on earth am I here for, as Pastor Rick Warren says? Now, regardless of where you find yourself right now, understanding who you are is a monumental, foundational, and pivotal thing to know 
in order to live a life of significance. Not who the world says you are or wants to be. Not who your friends say you are or want you to be. Um, not even possibly the dreams of your parents um, as it pertains to your life, as pure and great as that is. Not even who they say you are or they want you to be. But truly, God, who have you created and chosen and called me to be? Because listen, God has uniquely chosen to create us and to call us to the significant life of meaning and purpose. Now, as I said last week, you were created on purpose for purpose. And as we saw last week, we have an enemy, the devil, who hates God. And as a result, because of God creating man, you and me, in his image, Imago Dei, right? And considering us his most valuable, most prized possession in all of creation, the enemy hates us as well. And he wants to get back at God by trying to destroy us. So he spends all his time, overtime actually, doing all he can to keep us from understanding who we are to God, who we are in Christ, our God-created identity, our God-created purpose, as well as whose we are, who we belong to, um, being God's most prized, most prioritized creation. Which, when we know these things, listen, this gives us peace and it reveals to us worth. And then there's this, this piece of what we're called to be. He definitely does not know, what, he, he don't want us to know what we're called to be. The enemy is working overtime to keep us from knowing. In fact, more than anything, he does not want us to live into God's created design for our lives. He doesn't want us to understand our significance. And so he'll sift us and he'll seduce us with the goal of ultimately just lulling us into a deep sleep where we will just shuffle through life, seeking satisfaction and significance in anything and everything else while heaping more and more shame upon us so that if we con are confronted with the reality of Jesus, we feel like we can't even consider him, right? We we can't consider his love or his forgiveness or his freedom or his purposes because how could we be worthy of that? As far as we've gone, all the things we've done, how could, how could he really love us, right? Does he really know the real me? Because surely if he did, there's no way, there is just no way. I mean, like Adam and Eve, right? We're going to cover it all up, though he sees everything, and we're going to try and hide, though he knows everything. Now, last week, we spent some time in two um, in the text, two stories, familiar stories. One, the creation story, the garden in Genesis 2, the prodigal story, the son in Luke chapter 15, where I hope we saw the same story at play. If you didn't hear that message, please go back. I hope that it's going to be a, a, a monumental message for your life. Um, one of our stories describes our beginnings, the origin of our searching and seeking, um, seeing how did we get here? How did we get to this place um, two, it's, we saw that we're all the prodigal son due to our rebellion and our sin. So I want us to go back to that text this morning. Luke chapter 15, we're gonna, verse 11, we're going to pick up where we left off. And, and where we left off, let me just give you foundation. Here's what we know. Our story involves in verse 1 a, very, a wealthy man. He's got a lot of land. He's got a lot of livestock. Um, he's a revered man. He's a father. He's got two sons. One we really hyper-focused on last week who had such audacity and such a lack of love and respect really honestly for his father that he approaches his dad in verse 2 and he asks him for his share of, of the inheritance. Basically, by asking such an inappropriate and selfish question of his dad, he's basically saying, I don't want to live, under, remember, I don't want to live underneath your authority anymore. I want to live on my terms. I don't want to live under your rules. I don't want to live under your provision, your calling. Um, I want to be my own man, but I want you to pay for it. I want and need what you can give to me so I can go live my own version. I can go live my own truth. I can do my own things. In other words, I want the blessing of your hand, but I don't want you. I don't want, to, I don't want my seat at your table anymore. I don't care about my identity in the family as much as I care about building my own identity and my own brand. I don't want to do things your way anymore. I want to flee from underneath your care. I don't even want to wait until you die, so go ahead, just be dead already. That's basically what he's saying by saying, give me my share of the inheritance. Now, I'm sure dad is devastated, and so he complies with his son's command. Look at verse 13. We're going to skip to here. Not many days later, the story goes that the younger son gathers everything together. He goes on a journey into a distant country. I'm going to get as far away from you as I can, Dad. And there is where he chooses to squander the entirety of the inherited estate with loose living, the Bible says. And listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Because tragically, there is a season where sin can feel fun. But rebellion 
always gives way to ruin. Always. And it's exactly what happens to this wayward son. Verse 14. When he had spent everything, a severe famine occurs in that country, and he begins to be impoverished. See, the guy had it all at one time. Life was good for him. He was surrounded by wealth. He was surrounded by opportunity. He was, listen, he knew no need. None whatsoever. His name, who his father was, it was good enough. It gave him access instantaneously. Credibility. It came with great value, his name, who his father was. There, it gave him meaning. And now all that's gone. Now, instead of that, he knows lack. He knows need. He's hungry. And as the story goes, he goes desperate. He wakes up finally, and, and he realizes what he's done. He realizes the depth of his brokenness. And in total despair, totally humbled, feeling completely empty and unworthy, he decides to go home and to repent, not knowing what to expect. Maybe he'll allow me just to be one of the slaves in the field. That's just good enough for me. He goes home in total despair, ready to repent. And it's here last week that we saw the unconditional love of the father for his lost son. We see this in verse 20 start to play out. See, the father passionately and fully welcomes his son home, and he reminds him who he was, his son, and he restores him to his rightful place. We see that in verse 22. He places the family ring back on his hand. He, he puts the best robe upon him. And then he, he calls for the fattened calf to be killed so they, could, so they could just start to have a big celebration. His son is home. And no matter what his son had cost him and his family, the father completely and unconditionally forgives his son. What a beautiful, powerful story. But that's not all of it. There's another kid in the crib. <laughs> So this wayward, wasteful, wretch of a son had a brother. Look at verse 25. His older brother, his older son, I should say, the father's older son was in the field. Everybody stay in the field. And when he came, listen, he starts to come home, and he's approaching the house. Scripture says he begins to kind of hear music from a little distance. I wonder what's happening. He sees some dancing taking place. What in the world is going on? So he summons one of the servants, and he begins to inquire, what in the world is going on? Like, What's happening? And they say, you didn't hear? Your brother came home. Wait, what? Wait. Okay, so just think about this moment. He doesn't really, he doesn't have a lot of information. At least this is the way I see it play out in the movie of my mind. <laughs> he doesn't have a lot of information. He's coming up to the house, just a little distance off. He hears music. He, it's, when he gets close, he sees dancing. What in the world? Hey, what? Come here. What's happening? You, how, you didn't know? Wait, so you're telling me my brother is home? Like, what, what was the immediate feeling right there in that second upon hearing this news? Could it have been that, that there was immediate, ah, oh, just like this release of relief? Um, was there even a hint of emotion, of joy possibly? I mean, he's home? And this is what you think. But then the servant says this. Yeah, your father killed the fattened calf because he's received him back safe and sound. Wait, he did what? What did he do? Yeah, your dad. He called for the best calf, the most fat calf. And, and it was slaughtered and now there's a big celebration happening. So wait, you mean to tell me. So wait, so this, this son... This brother, he becomes angry. In my mind, I feel like he's, at this point, he's got to be belligerent. So belligerent that when he gets up to the house, Scripture says, he's not even willing to go inside. So dad comes out. Begins to plead with, come in. Come in. We've got so much to celebrate. Your brother, please come home. Come inside. Come into the house. Your brother has come home. He's safe. But the son looks at his dad and he says, for years, I've been serving you. For years, I have never neglected even a command of yours. And here, look, you've never even given me a goat. If there was even a hint of relief when he first heard about his brother being home, it's quickly overshadowed with this immense amount of just anger. You cannot be serious, Dad. Do you know? I mean, no one even came and told me. I had to find out for myself. No text, no email, right? I mean, hello. I mean, I, had to, I, I, I was in the field. 
No one even said, I was working for the family, on the family land, with the family, where I've been, taking care of the family business, doing what needed to be done for the family. Are you picking up something? Doing what was responsible, Dad, in the field. But when this son of yours comes home, who devoured your wealth with prostitutes. <laughs> See, oh, P.S. Dad, I'm the son working in the field. He's the son living the life of a fornicator. We squandered half of our family's net worth, and you killed the fattened calf for that? Oh, I know, just because he finally figured out he couldn't make it on his own, right? So he came home, and you just welcome him back just like that. After all. And, and here I am, after all that I have done, Dad, I have worked my fingers to the bone. I've even slaved over this land. I've never questioned you. I've never challenged you. I've never disrespected you. I've always done what was expected. I've always done what was, what was right. Where is the justice in this story? Here I am. I mean, this, this kid right here is dealing with some pretty big anger. He's got some offense going on. I mean, after all, he's doing all he, watch this, he's doing all he can. I'm trying to do my best to earn this, Dad. I'm trying to live a life that deserves what it is that you're going to give me one day when you tragically die. Do you see it? How many times have we worked to earn the love and to deserve the love of the Father? Maybe even right now we're living in this performance trap. We're working at it. We're trying. I'm in the field, God. I'm doing the best I can. Yes, yeah, sometimes I slip up. There's a little sin going on. I repent. I really do. But I'm in the field. I'm serving in kids' ministry. I don't even like kids. I'm allergic to them. They got diseases. They're germy. They always want to walk up and sneeze on me like, get away from me, Satan. I've been giving it to the table, God. Father, look, for so many years I've been serving you faithfully and I've never even neglected even a command and you've never even given me a young goat that I could celebrate with my friends, but then this comes home. She devoured your wealth. I mean, how quick we are to judge what the Father may want to do or is doing in other people's lives. But we may need to see this today. Listen, comparison will kill you. And if it doesn't kill us, it's going to completely pollute our ability to run our race because we become so preoccupied by staring at other people in, in other lanes. What is God doing there? See, the son was doing what he thought was expected, hoping to be noticed, hoping to be recognized. Look at me, Dad. Hoping to be promoted, right? Hoping to earn his father's approval, earn his father's affection to deserve it. Here I am, Dad, working hard, not complaining, at least out loud. I'm doing all the things. I'm doing the dance. And you know what, Dad? I'm even glad to do it. What more do I have to do to get your attention? Do I need to go do what he did? See, can I say this? As a recovering people pleaser, let me tell you, the do better, try harder, hamster wheel of performance, so you may get noticed or needed or even appreciated, can I say this? It is exhausting and it is unrelenting. And this son finds himself thinking, <laughs> surely by now I've proven myself, right? I mean, surely by now I've, I've earned something. I mean, even anything wouldn't even give me a goat. Look at this punk. Oh, yeah, he cares so much. He, he took out. Where am I? In the field. Look at this son of yours, Dad. Compared to him, I deserve a medal. I deserve commendation. You know what? He deserves condemnation. Compared to him, I deserve to be promoted. You know what? He deserves to be deported. Stay where you are, dude. 
We're doing fine. Don't make that political. <laughs> I heard the chuckles. I heard the chuckles. That's not what I'm saying. I mean, Dad, he left you as good as dead. He didn't even want you, what you had to offer him anymore. And now he, I mean, he squandered, literally devoured one half of our net worth as a family on what? And, and you break out your very best for him? What has he done to earn this? What has he done to desert? Look at me, Dad. Look what I've done. Look what I'm doing. I'm working harder. I'm doing more. I've been honorable. I've been the picture of a model son, a model heir one day. I've carried the, fairy na- the family name well, and I haven't asked anything of you. you. Wouldn't even give me a goat. Even after everything. But you give this guy. Exactly, son. That's exactly what I did. I was glad to do it. Look at verse 31. Son, you've always been with me. And everything that is mine, everything that I have is yours. All of my life is for you. You've always been with me. He left, and I didn't know if I would ever see him again. And just like you have the fullness of my heart and everything that is of me, he does too. And now he's home. That's exactly what I did, son. That's exactly what I did. See, don't miss this truth this morning. It wasn't what the son did, or listen to me, it wasn't what the son did or didn't do that pleased the father. Listen, it was that the father was already pleased in simply who his son was. Some of us need to hear that this morning. It's not what you did or didn't do. It's not what you're doing relentlessly. It's the fact that when you've surrendered your life to Jesus and God looks upon you and he sees the sacrifice of Jesus, he is already so pleased because he knows, oh yeah, this one's ready. This one's come home to me. And he is pleased with who you are. It's not what you do. You're not going to deserve this. You're not going to earn this. This was his son. He loved him simply because of who. The father didn't love his kids based on their activity. The father loved his kids based on their identity. And maybe somebody needs to hear this today. Jesus is invested in you because of who he created you and chose you and called you to be. Not because of what you might do for him, in, even in his name. Not even because of what you didn't do or haven't done. Son, you've always been with me and everything, all that is mine is yours. What greater way to illustrate this by sending Jesus on our behalf? Not, son, you've always done for me. I'm so proud. so proud so so now yeah now you've earned it not that not that I think sometimes we find a strange amount of comfort I mean just strangely amount of comfort on this hamster wheel of do better try harder and I think God is is trying to say to us today it's not what you do it's who you are it's not your activity for God trying to earn something from God Um, it's not a prerequisite it's a response. It's, it's not the activity. It's the identity. It's who he created you to be. Returning back to that imago day, God designed that he sent Jesus to die so that you could receive back. You abdicate it all in the garden and you receive it all at the cross. See, what you do, again, not a prerequisite. You cannot work your way to God. You can't earn your way to God. You're not smart enough to get to God. It's not about what you can do. It's about what Jesus has done. It's not about what you do. It's about who you are because of Jesus. In Jesus. In Jesus. Somebody say this. Ready? From now on. Say it like you mean it. From now on. 
See, some of us need to plant the flag on the field of your life today with these, these words from now on. I'm not going to think this way anymore. I'm going to rest in who I am in Christ from now on. I'm not going to believe the devil's lies anymore, what he says about me from now on. I'm not going to question God anymore from now on. I'm not going to try to work to earn and deserve God's love anymore, God's favor anymore. No, no. I'm going to walk in God's favor, and I'm going to work out of a gratitude for God. I'm going to give out of a gratitude for God from now on. Say from now on. So let me break this off of this this morning and repeat after me. It's not what I do. It's who I am. Now listen to this. It may be what you've done, but it's not who you are. I remember a couple times in life where I needed to hear that, and I've had a couple times in my boys' lives where I needed to look them dead in the eye and say, That might be what you did, but that's not to who you are. Let me keep going. Remember growing up in school, first day, walk into the cafeteria? There's no anxiety in that whatsoever. (laughs) It's the bestest. You walk in, you're like, who am I going to sit with at lunch? Well, there's the emos. You know, we call them the goths. I shopped at Gap. They shopped at Hot Topic, a.k.a. Goth Gap. (laughs) Yeah. Um, There's the kickers. There's the preppies. You know, there's the, uh, the cowboy, the kickers. There, there's the, uh, the, uh, 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 the jocks, right? I don't know who else, right? Labels, 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 labels. And then and, and maybe some of those are, are, you know, they're okay, but whatever. Um, then there's uh, the labels of this, uh, good labels. Teacher, musician, writer, friend, pastor, whatever, good labels, right? And then what about these labels? Sinner, liar, um, glutton. Town tramp, cheater. See, often we base our identity on the wrong equation. Someone sees something, they say something, they they label. Sometimes it's just out of their own insecurity. Sometimes they're just mean, they don't know the Lord. They label, right? And so we we base our identity on the wrong equation. Too often we allow Satan's accusations um, of our behavior influence our perception of identity. Instead of letting our identity as a child of God in Christ influence our behavior, we'll listen to those lies and we'll allow that to impact us. Now all of a sudden we take on this identity because it's a label that we've, we've chosen to wear. Maybe it's been given to us and maybe we even get to be proud of that label. Because at least we're identified and we belong somewhere. We fail, so we see ourselves as failures, which only causes us to fail more. We sin, so we see ourselves as sinners, which only causes us to sin more. We all too often get sucked into the devil's futile Equation. We've been tricked into believing that what we do makes us who we are. Therefore, because I am this, I must be that. We've been tricked into believing that this is all there is. And there's this false belief that attaches to it. It sends us into this tailspin of hopelessness and total defeat. But we cannot be deceived. You are not the product of what you do or don't do. You are the product of who you are in Christ and his work on the cross. You are not saved, listen to me, you are not saved by how you behave, but how you believe. Do you believe that Jesus came and died for your sin so that you could be restored into that imago Dei, created image of God that he breathed into existence? You want to read something that will bless you today? Go read Psalm 139. In fact, write that down. Go read Psalm 139. 1 John chapter 3 says this, this is such assurance, right? Beloved, we're now children of God, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. As the band comes this morning, we're going to close. I don't have enough time to go into this, but in John chapter 8, we see this fascinating story of this woman who's caught in the act of adultery. Culturally speaking, when you catch someone in the act of adultery, it takes two to tango. And so... Both should have been brought before the leaders for punishment. Both, but no, only this woman. She's brought before the leaders. Jesus happens to be on the scene. They want to test him. So they start asking questions. We've got grounds for accusing, so let's, let's see what we can do here. They persist to ask him questions well, what, what should we do? You know, what should we do? The law of Moses says this. What, what do you say? And he's looking around. He's like, well, where's the dude? Doesn't say anything. Just begins to write in the sand. We don't know what he's writing in the dirt. 
I was thinking about that earlier. I, don't, I wish I knew. Don't you wish you knew what Jesus was writing in the, in the dirt right there? He doesn't say anything. He just starts writing. I don't know if he's writing names like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't know what he's doing, right? He's doing something. He's doing enough to where they're about to stone this woman, and they all drop their rocks and walk away. Here's what I want you to see. Look at this. <laughs> Jesus says, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? Not one, Lord. I don't either. Now go and sin no more. But before he says that, he says three words. Look at it with me. Verse 11. I don't know if it's on your screen, but check it out. I don't condemn you. And he says, from now on. Remember, say it with me. From now on, go and sin no more. Not only did Jesus forgive her and restore her from her past, but he speaks into her future. Come on, somebody. From now on. Jesus has rescued her out of her circumstance, and he's changed her situation. But Jesus isn't only interested in changing your circumstance or your situation. And listen to me. He's also not just interested in changing your eternal destination. He is interested in total transformation. He wants to rip off what the label is that someone has placed upon you. He wants to take away the expectation that someone has placed upon you. And he wants to give you peace and worth and meaning and value. Total transportation from now on. That's maybe what you did, but it's not who you are. Go and sin no more. Oh, would you stand to your feet with me for just a second? You know what I love the most about this? I was talking about this just a few days ago. Do you find the irony in the fact that Jesus was just there on the scene waiting? See, we like to think that it's, it's God's fault that we find ourselves in situations of circumstance and suffering and punishment. But no, nope, she did that. But when she's about to be completely punished, Jesus just happens to be there waiting for her. You see it? He just happens to be there. And what does he choose to do? He chooses to get between the accusers and the accused. Doesn't even need to say anything to them. Woman, where'd they go? You know what I think Jesus wants to say to you right now? Where's all those people who are accusing you? Where's all those people who are labeling you? It's not what you do. It's who you are. And you know what? Maybe it's what you did. But it's not who you are now. From now on, go and sin no more. Would you close your eyes? The band's going to lead us in just a a brief time of response this morning. And I'm going to have um, just a time where we can just maybe pray, spend some time in gratitude to God. If you want to come to the response tables and we have communion, Eucharist, Lord's Supper, we have supply there for you in the front and the back. If you need prayer, we're going to have a prayer team and they're going to be over against the curtain to your far right need that but can we just respond for just a moment this deep gratitude for God and his goodness just pour our love out thank you Jesus 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 thank you thank you Jesus maybe you're here and you've never trusted Jesus right now where you are would you just say Jesus I need you Jesus, I need you. I want to trust you. Not, not just religion. Not just, I'm not joining a church. I, I'm, I'm giving my life to you, Jesus. And would you empty me? Say that to him. Would you empty me of my past, of my failure, of my sin, of my shame? And would you fill me with your Holy Spirit and transform my life? Hey, if you prayed that, would you raise a hand up and hold it up for just a second? If you just prayed like that to the Lord. Anybody in the house? Or online even. This morning, if you'd said that prayer, would you today text 
the name Jesus to the number 43,000. We have some information there for you. Let's respond to the Lord for just a moment before we go. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in Goodness.